pain in the hippocampus, for example, for possible therapies. So that's one question they had, and they actually they did perform a literature, literature search throughout all to try and find sentences that were talking about this gene specifically expressed in this region. But they also, of course, employed uh, microarray data and Allen Brain Atlas data to help inform their selection of region-specific genes. Another question is which brain regions are connected? For example, which ones are co-activated in an fMRI study or are found to be connected through a track tracing study? Another question is which brain regions are affected by a specific disease? For example, um, substantia nigra and Parkinson's disease. Another question is uh, just which neuron types are found in a specific brain region? example sentences to sort of show you what these answers might look like in the in the literature. So here's the first one. Galanin has immunocytochemistry to occur in most large acetylcholinergic neurons in the nucleus basalis of minor. And here's another one where it talks about the loss of neurons in the nucleus basalis of minor and also it's found in Alzheimer's disease, paralysis, agitans, and other disease. So and also it's, it's nice to note that Sentences are like this, but these are sort of were found at the introduction of abstracts, so they're sort of treated as sort of known knowledge to introduce the research into the paper. So there's a lot of motivating work already done in this area. There's a lot of work in searching the neuroscience literature and also searching the neuroscience data sets. Um, so there's Techspresso for neuroscience, for example, which is a website, so PubBrain which uh, can bring the results into an actual spatial brain space. And of course, uh, the neuroscience information framework, which is key for actually helping you search the resources as well. And also, there's some very good papers. Um, this one from Gully Burns and uh, Wang and Hovey, where they track connectivity reports from the biomedical literature. So this is kind of similar to what I'm working on. They do actually try and pull out brain regions. And here's another example more recently, um, where they're talking about brain gene disease co-occurrences. So they're going, sort of using um, TBI to search for abstracts that contain both a mention of a brain region and also a mention of disease or a gene. So they can sort of form these relationships and form a network between genes, genetic disorders, and brain areas. <clears throat> so there's a lot of people working on this, and it's definitely interesting work. So are sort of motivating examples. So for our project, we're doing a pretty a similar stuff, but we're um we're more focused on sort of text mining the abstracts using existing natural language processing. And right now at these stages we're focused on brain regions. So for all those questions I showed you a couple of slides back, things is you have to be able to know when an author is talking about a specific brain region. And then we spent a lot of time pro uh, providing a very detailed evaluations of this to try and figure out what works, what doesn't work, and what are the challenges. <clears throat> so as I said before, I have some background in bioinformatics, and, and there's over 10 years of work in bioinformatics from a, a similar sort of perspective. So there's a bit from 1999 where they tried to extract protein, protein, and the idea is you have a sentence where the author says, this protein forms a complex with this other protein. So They've been working on that for a while, and actually there's now actual competition called the Critical Assessment of Information Extraction in Biology, so BioCreative. And I think in the last one, in BioCreative 2, not 2.5, but in the BioCreative 2, there's about five worldwide teams competing on three subtasks, three or four subtasks, in order to pull out these protein-protein interactions. A lot of inspiration for this work, and we try and reuse methods from from their um, results and their papers. So, and another interesting website, if you want to check it out, is IHOP. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with pancakes, but 
It's information hyperlinked over proteins, and that's sort of a, you can type in your favorite gene there, and it will go through all of PubMed and show you sentences that match, the bench, that match your gene and another gene. So these are sort of, provide great inspiration for them. So to do this, the first step sort of is to create a good manually curated training data set. So this is what we did early on. We went through the Journal of Comparative Neurology and randomly chose abstracts. And we went through and the curator manually annotated whenever the author mentioned a brain region. So think of just, yeah, printing out a bunch of abstracts and just going over in yellow highlighter, here's a brain region. Of course, it was, it was all done in a computer in an interface that actually the gate uh, software framework was used. So it's pretty good. It's, what's nice here is we have a large amount of abstracts, and it covers about almost 18,000 brain region mentions. And one of the pre-processing steps is we automatically um, use the tool to expand abbreviations to their full forms to prevent having to deal with those short, ambiguous three-letter abbreviations, which I'll, I'll come that back to later. So here's just an example where the regions were highlighted. Uh, this is probably, this, this is a good example, I guess, because it shows some of the challenges. So actually, let me, can everyone sort of see my mouse pointer? I wonder if that's working OK. Yep, your mouse pointer, pointer's fine. OK, great, thanks. So, so here you can see in, in the title, there's um, sort of a coordinating conjunction where combined together with this and. So that's like a problem. Should these, should these, should these be annotated separately? And that's an example of some of the problems. Another problem, you can see there's lots of abbreviations throughout here. Um, most of them are expanded, so MD have been expanded. So if you see MD somewhere else in here, it's been expanded to the full form. So for example, PL and BLA. So here PL is expanded. But here's an example where the automatic abbreviation expander failed. So you can see it sort of failed to figure out that there's two abbreviations here linked to two long forms. But overall, the abbreviation expansion is pretty accurate with over 90% accuracy, which is worthwhile for these examples. So, so here's just a, that same example sentence. So you can see also that there's lots of interesting entities in here. So there's galanins or this molecule, and then there's also a type of neurons here, and it's saying, and then here's the brain region, which I'm going to focus on from here forward. So the idea is you want to first, well, as we were done before, we were manually annotating this, so highlighting it in a different color. And basically, the information there is basically it's a span from character 103 to 129. So the idea is it'd be great if you could train a computer to say, to do the same thing, to mark, you know, this character, this character, the author's talking about a brain region. And that's sort of the goal for this first step of the, the presentation. So what we did to do that, we hooked up um, a sort of already existing, um, and it's a pretty cutting edge uh, method. It's a conditional random field framework, and it's the Mallet Toolkit by Andrew McCallum. And so we hooked that up, and we pretty much use standard settings. So also one of the things is you try and give it a neuroscience domain feature list. So it tries to learn where these spans are. So you can give it examples of brain region names from a dictionary, for example. Um, and we hooked that up, and it did pretty well. One of, the, one of the biggest things that helped us the most is that the size of our data set. So, so you split our, our input data set into a training and testing set. And since we had a large, da large data set, the training information worked really well. It was well enough to, for it to form a good statistical model of its own of what these brain regions look like when an author mentions them. But still, of course, it's, it's not perfect. So there's errors from the coordinating conjunction. So dorsal and ventral hippocampus, for example, are previously unseen words. So it's just something a brain region's never seen before. So that's a huge problem. But again, and then also brain regions of less commonly studied organisms, which are also rare. So again, so there's, yeah, many different organisms throughout this training data. So there's over 200 species, which I'll, I'll have a slide on further up. So that's one of the problems. So you can give it a dictionary of brain regions for rat, mouse, human, and macaque, but still, 
it won't have a good idea if it sees an insect brain region. So we found a lot of the improvements were from context windows, uh, lemmatization. So this is sort of turning the word into the base form of the word. So for example, removing the plural uh, endings of the word, which I'll talk about more, and also abbreviation expansion. So turns out this probably gave us around a 2% increase in performance by expanding these abbreviations early on. So giving the, the conditional random field the full expanded version of that sentence. And so the recall is about 76% of the brain region spans at 81 precision, which we believe is pretty worthwhile, especially when you compare it to um, dictionary-based approaches where they just match it up exactly. So here's uh, the uh, So yep. a question. Yep. Uh, what was your training size set, the size of your training set? Um, it would be, OK, so we did eight-fold cross-validation. So it would be seven seven eighths of this 1300. So I think I think it's around 1100 abstracts would be treated as training. And then about the remainder, a couple hundred would be test. But that was a, a, a cross validation. So every abstract was be treated would be treated as a test, a test example at least once. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Eightfold cross validation. And it was done at the sentence level, but it's important to note the cross-validation splits were done at the document level. So there's no cases where a sentence would be in the one, one abstract sentence would be in the training data and another sentence would be in the test. That did not occur. So either the whole abstract's in training, all the sentences are in the training set, or all of them are in the test set. And so here's just an example of a dictionary matching. So this is done by some of the existing methods. Um, so they'll just have a big dictionary of brain region names, and they'll just look for exact or pretty close to exact uh, matches. And so you can sort of see that in blue here. It sort of does OK. It has actually has near perfect precision um, when you look at the lenient measure. So this strict measure actually requires that it's an exact character to character match. So what the annotator did manually by hand, all those same letters are annotated by the dictionary method. So that's sort of the difference between these strict and lenient measures. Lenient measures, all it requires is some overlap, and it's considered a match. So yeah, so recall is not so great. So it's missing a fair amount. As you can see in the red, they're just red alone. And also precision is pretty good. It's probably actually higher just because there's differences and how these dictionaries are constructed compared to the guidelines. So for example, we had a rule where we did not annotate white matter tracks, but in the dictionary there will be white matter tracks, so that will lead to problems in the precision number. So it will lead to disagreements. So but yeah, so dictionary works. Dictionary matching has the advantage that usually you can match these entries in the dictionary to a, the concept in the atlas. And then here's the example using the, the full conditional random field, so including the, all the features we use. So this is the neuroscience dictionary information, for example. And part of speech features were also used, so if it's a noun or a verb, for example. And you can see it's pretty good overlap. And there's actually some regions where the conditional random field annotated it, but the manual curator did not. Um, but again, so across all the abstracts, here's the table. So again, it's, it's much better in terms of precision and recall. And the F measure is sort of the combination of these two. So it's pretty precise. And it's also recalling a lot of the annotated ones. And for lenient, again, it's pretty good. And so the, these two rows here, so this is the text-only conditional random field. So this is the conditional random field where we do not provide it any neuroscience domain information. It, it learns all that information just from that text itself. And also, it doesn't have any part of speech information. So it does pretty good just by having a lot of abstracts. And if you bring in some of the neuroscience information, domain information, extra features, it does perform a little bit better, but it's barely noticeable, mostly in recall, which makes sense, as I'll, I'll mention further. So and here's just a, sort, of, sort of gives you a feel for what the conditional random field is doing. So this is sort of some of the features from the text only. 
So for example, if it sees the token the before the current word, then that increases its confidence in that the next word is a brain region. And so for example, if, if the previous word is monkey or rat, a similar example, to say you're talking about the rat hippocampus, then that increases its confidence at the next word. Also words like projection show up if it's two words in front of the previous word. And also, yeah, so one thing that I should note here that this this sort of gives you a clue that it might this work might not be generalized well outside of the journal of neurology because a lot of these words are general. So they might be talking about you know, the rat gene X, for example. So, so this we'll have to be careful when we move it outside of the Journal of Comparative Neurology, as you can see, because these features are sort of customized for that journal. But yeah, so, so here's the example sentence again. So we have this span from character 103 to 129. So now we have an automatic way to do that. And let me see, so, so that's pretty much that. So now you have this string. So you can have this isolated string. You can turn this whole sentence into just one string and focus on that. And so then the next step is what we call sort of normalization or resolution. And they do similar stuff for genes. So you have a gene mentioned, but you want to get the actual gene identifier. So you have this sort of identifier in some neuroanatomical atlas or lexicon that directly links you to the concept. Is there any questions at this point before I move into this next stage? Um, so the going back to your uh, results from before, there's clearly an improvement when you are using the full text. So this the slide, right? So you're using text only compared to dictionary matching, and then all features is clearly improving the score, right? right. The question was uh, is what do you think the CRF is catching that the dictionary matching is not? And then again, what do you think the all features is catching that the Okay, I think I understand the question. So what, what is, yeah, the improvement? What's gaining? So, so these sort of features sort of tell you that the dictionary matching is ignoring all of this context information completely. So that's, that's probably the key thing. And also there's, so that's one set. So it's basically this context information mostly. So it will look at the previous two words and the following two words, and it will use that to determine if the current word. So the dictionary matching will, will ignore these other two words. And it also, the way the conditional random field works, it also uses sort of the probability generated from the whole sentence. So for the whole sentence, it, it generates a labeling. So it's also learning the negative words and the positive words, where the dictionary matching is just focused on what's a positive word, which has been known. Okay. Yeah, all right. And all, so all features go slightly beyond that, so they can have a thing like if the current token is a noun or a verb. And again, that's not in the dictionary, and that's not in the text base, so that, for example, part of speech. But you, you are not really uh, extracting the part um, for this, for the all features, conditional random field, yeah, we, we hooked up, I forget, that we had an existing method, so it was based on the Genia, Genia okay. um, corpus, and it's, a, it's actually, yeah, and it's a part of the specifically customized for PubMed. Okay, and is that from LinkedIn or somewhere else? No, it's from um, String IE, I think it's a pure fork lab. Um, okay, yeah, okay, I'm not aware of that. I, oh, I have I, information at the end. Okay, all right, yeah, thanks. Okay, so, yeah, so this is the step, the next step is sort of the normalization or the resolution. So the goal is once you have it to this identifier, then, for example, you can go into neuroscience information framework, and there's a wealth of information tied to this. For example, what neurons have been annotated as being in brain region. So this is the step. So as input, we're sort of um, just keeping it isolated from the previous step by using the manually annotated dimensions, at least for now, for testing it out, to the predicted ones. 
and, uh, coming forward in the next slides. Um, <clears throat> so the problem, we had some trouble with the lexicons. What we decided to do, because there wasn't, there's many lexicons, so we, we used five target lexicons, which have over 11,000 terms. So the goal was to increase our resolution. So if, if one lexicon is a synonym or a different way of describing that brain region, then we wanted to bring that in as much as possible. So we just brought those all in. I'll go into detail on those on the next slide. We tested five different mapping methods in order to get the target string into this identifier. Um, one existing method from a chart, another group, so I'll go into detail again. Um, and we did a lot of evaluation, so we did a lot of manual evaluation, so, and I'll talk about that too. So. And we also put in several um, editors that modify dimensions. And I'll go over all of this in detail. So here's the target lexicons, and I, I thank all these resources for putting their um, lexicons or atlases or ontologies. Some of them are are slightly different, but they're all accessible, which is great. Uh, Neuronames is the largest and I think the oldest, so it has a lot of terms. Um, so this is the neuroscience information uh, framework standard ontology. I forget what it, this expands to, but it's NIFSTD. So and it's a fair amount of terms, so there's a good amount of synonym information. And then there's also the BRAID database, which is linked to um, fMRI database of uh, FMI ROI results. And we need some minor uh, things like remove ref left and right prefixes so it's consistent with the others. And there's, there's some synonym information here as well. And then there's also the brain architecture management system from the Larry Swanson 1998 uh, rat brain atlas. And it has about 962 regions. Um, there's no synonym information here, but I believe they have synonym information in the database, which I should probably look into. And so this is good because it can be linked to connectivity reports. And then this is also good, the Allen Brain Atlas Reference Atlas by Dong, and it has 910 brain regions. <clears throat> so you sort of see a sort of consistent number of around 1,000, maybe 1,100, maybe 1,300 concepts, which is similar across this mouse, rat, human, <clears throat> and a uh, I guess there's a mix of organisms, but so there's a, probably a ton of overlap here, but it's hard to pull out as this sort of figure shows. So this is a bit, this is just if you take all of these terms, so actually, so this number's a bit off, but basically all these terms, I think is the old figure, and you just try and do like, turn it into a Venn diagram and see how many of these phrases or terms, so so how many of them all have hippocampus? And you turn that into sort of an Euler diagram, so area proportional to their size. And you see some overlap. But remember, this is, this is a bit biased because this is exact string matching. So it has to match character to character, ignoring uh, uppercase and lowercase. So we're kind of surprised to see this, but it, we're, it's kind of good to see there's at least some overlap. So again, that's case and sensitive string matching. So I, much more concepts overlap, of course, but they just use different ways of phrasing things. So. And there's actually, surprisingly, only 29 terms that are in every one of these five ontologies. And of course, they're mostly major divisions. And there's about a 25% matchup between BAMS and Allen Brain Atlas. So it's the rat and mouse atlases. Oh, and also, I should note, um, these two are sort of well-defined. You could call these an atlas because they're they have sort of a spatial connection to all these brain regions. And this one is sort of linked to um, ROI, sort of. Whereas these two, it's less clear, the spatial representation of the brain region. Sorry, I'll try and stay on track here. So again, yeah, just a lot of things like lexical variants, like commas, brackets, uh, special characters. So RAFE with the E or this uh, E with the accent mark above it. I'm not sure what that's called, but yeah. And here's us just some example of sort of terms that are found only in one source. So you see stuff like seahorse. Uh, I guess that's for hippocampus, I should check. But, um, and then sometimes the, the author of the atlas and the year is encoded. And sometimes there's white matter tracks, for example. But anyway, so it's good that we have all five loaded in, so now we can do some matching. So just a simple naive approach is just 
like I did previously, ignore the uppercase and lowercase and match every letter for every letter. Going beyond that, what you can do is you can stem those words. So I'll show you an example. This is where you sort of convert it into the base form of the word and try and match that. And you can do that letter for letter as well once you get those stems. Um, then you can do bag of words matching. So you, you convert the phrase into the separate words and try and match them and just ignore the order. So that's where it's a bag. You just jumble all the words up, ignore the order they appear in. And then you can do the similar thing with the stems. So do a bag of stems. And then also this has been sort of applied before um, for a mapping of thalamic atlases, so cross-species mapping of thalamic atlases. So different, slightly different domain, but it has been used in neuroscience and they found it to be successful. So yeah. Oh, hey. Sorry. Hey, Paul. No problem. How's it going? Good. Oh, I, am I catching the, uh, the middle of the... Yeah. Oh, sorry. No problem. So that's my supervisor, Paul. He can also help answer questions if he uh, calls in, but yeah. Um, so Loom simple mapping match is a third one. So this is uh, another one that's also been used, but also again in a different domain. So this is um, this is sort of different. All of these first four are pretty similar in how they match, but this one's slightly different, and that allows a one character mismatch for words oh. over a certain length. So this is also yet yeah, has been applied for ontology mapping. So for example, one. Uh, ontology of anatomy, trying to map it to another to find these cross ontology mapping. So this has been tested as well in our framework. So this is the stem matching. Um, this is one that kind of works pretty well. So again, tokenized conversor stem forms. Uh, we use the Lovin, Lovin's stemmer implementation from the key phrase extraction algorithm. And so this is an example. So here's your multi-word a mention that was pulled out of the abstract, and it will be converted to this. So it cuts off the AL and ventral, for example. It cuts off, so parts turns into part, and this is sort of the result. So try to remove some of this lexical variation. And again, so a similar procedure will be applied on the target lexicon. So neuro names or the, or um, for example, the Allen Brain Atlas names will have the same procedure, and then they'll be tried to match against each other. So. We start performing these, and we started noticing um, some errors here and there. And, and you see these errors, and you're like, well, that's easy to fix. So, you know, I could write a regular expression, or I could write a rule to sort of modify these things. So we, we played around with that a little bit. Um, it's not really a type of matching, but instead it changes the mention. For example, lateral part of the olfactory amygdala will match to this if you remove part of the so in, in your dictionary, it will look like this. It won't have this, these sort of words, common words in here, which can be seen as important. Depends on your point of view. Another idea is you have these conjunctions, as we mentioned before, so lateral and medial olfactory amygdala. And the key there is if you can sort of split these into two parts and then match this one separately and match this one separately. Here's another way of doing it. So this is the sort of an expansion of how we did that one. So basically, we just gave it a list of all these possible like neuroanatomical directions so that we have about 50 of these. And you just say, does the mention start with one of these, two of these things in a list separated by an and or an or or a two? Not sure if I have the two there, but yeah. So, so it will split this, this into two because it recognizes. So basically, it's a simple rule. You see one direction and another direction, split it into two separate mentions and match them separately. And another one is hemisphere stripper. So if the mention has like the left something, for example, the left temporal cortex, then just remove that left because that left is not in our dictionaries. Or for example, ipsilateral or contralateral, words like that, just remove those. Another one is, yeah, as I mentioned before, you want to remove of the phrases. There's lots of variants of this which again, there's some information here, but we're willing to remove these in order to get a match over no match. So division of the segment of the, there's all kinds like bank of the, like that. So that's removing information, but even these are much more. So we have two editors that will remove a lot of information. So 
For example, dorsal hippocampus will just turn into hippocampus by using this editor. And here's another editor, if it says nucleus of some brain region, we'll just remove nucleus of the phrase in an attempt to match it. So these mentioned editors will be done sort of as a last resort. So if we fail to map it using any of the other techniques, then we start discarding information, losing this information that the author wrote in order to get a match. So, and this is sort of the direction matching technique that I mentioned previously sort of does this automatically. They will match the longest span where possible. But here we're doing it explicitly so we can sort of record this information as we do it. So here's just sort of the ones I mentioned sort of already, maybe a few more. So this column here is if they're discarding information and these bottom three sort of do. So this is another one that removes things. So for example, if they say a cytoarchitectural description, so if the cells there are really big in that part of the, the brain region, then we sort of discard that in order to get a map to the enclosing region, in order to match the enclosing region. And again, here it is again. So the caudal cunate nucleus, we remove the caudal in order to match to the enclosing region. And same thing here nucleus of the pontu bulb or body, and then we just match it to the enclosing region by um, removing this nucleus of specifier. And so again, these ones are done as a last resort sort of to get a match. And then also this one at the top, as I mentioned before, it splits it into two separate mentions. For example, rostral part of the medial accessory olive. So one of the things you can just remove part of that, and you'll get this one. Uh, you can remove the rostral part in the front, and you'll get part of, which is a bit awkward, that won't match. But once you get, ri get rid of both of these, the rostral and the part of the, then you'll get a match to the medial accessory olive. And that will match to BAMS and I think a couple other um, apologies or atlases or lexicons. And again, going ir even further, if this failed to match, I'll actually perform one more uh, removal step of a direction prefix. So remove this one first and then this one second, in hopes of matching this. And this is sort of the framework, uh, maybe so to sort of visualize what's going on here. So you have the abstract the manual annotation, and then so you have this mention, the string, and you can edit it if it's required, and then you try all the different resolvers to try and get it to some term that was used in an atlas. So there are the atlas we go through as before, extract the labels and all the synonyms. And then I go through sort of most of them by hand and do a manual sort of evaluation at this stage to see if this makes sense. And then here's sort of an example. So, and also this is sort of the, the underlying data set that I made for this, the underlying data representation is basically this in uh, RDF. So it's a semantic web compatible as much as I can make it, yeah. So, and then yeah, that will be available soon. The RDF. So, and here's an example. You have the PubMed, the identifier. Here's the string that was found in that abstract. And then you send these mention editors, and the mention ed editors break it into two parts. And then so you have these two separate mentions, and they're both matched to um, this is the Allen Brain Atlas, the BAMS ontology, and then two neural names terms. And yeah, I'm not sure if NIF would be here too. It possibly is. So that's just an a general idea of how it looks. And yeah, the big issue here is that these arrows, there's lots of uh, many-to-many -many relationships or one-to-many relationships as well, which is annoying to deal with, but it's, it's possible. And you can filter it based on that. So this is sort of the evaluation framework. Um, one of the things we did to save work, um, not all of these will be correct, but we assumed all the ones that matched with exact string matching so there is no modifications performed. Uh, we assumed they were correct. Mostly save time, but there's limited amount you can do once they do exactly match. It, you'd have to look at context, for example. Um, and also, I hand marked the specific to general matches. So as I said before, this is where you map a subregion to the enclosing region. So this is good, so then I can get numbers on how often this occurs, for example. Uh, one of the things I did for the evaluation is mostly ignore the organism disagreement if the names match. So hippocampus and rabbit would still be marked as a hippocampus except. I'm not sure. 
Yeah, that, that type of setup. It, it becomes tricky and it's hard to get guidelines for this, just like our previous annotation step. But we tried to make it all transparent. For example, you can download all these evaluations. Resources like the PubMed concept, we'd look at the abstracts, we'd go into, for example, the NeuroNames resource, uh, Brain Info, and also other atlases to see if this was a, if the author was trying to talk about the same region. And there is some problems where there's ambiguity and we had some guidelines to deal with. It's, it's not easy. Um, and yeah, this is a general idea. We'd take the synonyms into account. Um, so it's a bit tricky when we show the evaluations because there's a bunch of ways you can count the mentions. You can just uh, straight up count the mentions or frequency. So if you do this, uh, cortex will be the most frequently mentioned term, especially if you're, um, you're uh, expanding these abbreviations. So they mention, many main brain regions will be mentioned several times, but usually the, the subsequent mentions will be abbreviations. We're expanding that for the full terms. And so again, common terms that weigh the rate of change. Some cortex would, so an evaluation metric that uses this um, favors the commonly occurring terms. And again, like, as you can guess, it, there's many rare terms that occur a lot. So sort of the long tail has a significant effect here, a less significant effect by this weighting. If you use the unique mentions, then you're weighting every, every brain region mentioned equally. So the rare terms show up equally. So cortex would have the same weight in the evaluation as dorsal media or superior temporal lobe of the cortex. So something very specific will have an equal weight. Um, and also, you can, another way you can do it is count, many, count how many sort of abstract mentioned pairings. So count how many abstracts that brain region occurs in and ignore how many times within that abstract occurs, how many, time the, how many times the author uses that in the abstract. That's another way of doing it, which makes the results kind of confusing. But here's the number. So if you just look at the frequency account with the more common ones, sort of biasing this, you get 63% of the occurrences are resolved, which you're pretty happy with. I think it's pretty worthwhile to get that amount, especially compared to the dictionary techniques. Um, if you bring it down to just looking at the abstract mention pairings, you get about 58% of resolved. And then here you can see it drops quite a bit when you're looking at the unique mentions. So this is where the rare mentions are failing, are failing to resolve, whereas the common mentions up here are resolving well. These rare ones are not. And this is, we'll talk about this more actually, but part of it is a species uh, specific brain regions. And again, so the, the nice thing is that we found the methods are very precise. So that sort of makes sense given the, um, the methods we chose are pretty strict matching. We required mostly all of the words to match unless it goes to match. So I also note that a specific to general match where they match to an enclosing region, I consider that to be an except in this number. Sort of a huge chunk of this 94% is the specific to general matches where you're not matching exactly, you're matching to an enclosing region, which is not so great. And again, so this is focused on one journal, so the Journal of Comparative Neurology. So again, this might not scale too well to other journals, for example. But also, this journal has a lot of new brain regions where an author goes into detail of a brain region, and that's probably generating some of these rare terms where they're describing a new segmentation, a new part of a brain region that was not previously uh, characterized. So this is a bit of a busy table here, but this is just saying, as we start bringing in these sort of tuning and modifications from a baseline technique and bringing in these um, very unique. We don't really gain much in terms of match mentions until the bottom. So this is sort of known already in text mining. You can go through and make specific rules, for example, and they'll be very high precision, but they won't change your recall. They'll only apply to a very few instances in your data set. So you see that here. It doesn't really change things much. So the sort of the key thing is the specific to general mapping. So where I'm enclosing to region is as expected. It's it's showing up in these regions that are discarding information. So once we start discarding information, then we're able to match to the enclosing region. And again, you can see not many matches, not many mentions actually make use of these rules, which is kind of sad. So it sort of tells you it's a bit of a waste of time to write these hand rules. They're not giving you that much in terms of uh, performance. Okay, so try and 
speed it up a bit. So one thing that comes into play is species. And what's great is this, um, someone has uh, put together a piece of software and written a paper where they, they made an open source and accessible um, species name identification system for biomedical literature. And it's very accurate. It's pretty accurate. They've tested it on a bunch of evaluation sets. So we hooked this up. And so we can go through and, and now we can label all of the abstracts in our data set for what species are found in them. And there's a lot. There's about 273. And most of the abstracts have one uh, species mentioned in it. Some of them have two or more than one, and some of them have none, but it does pretty well. And then here's just a, a little graph that's kind of neat to show you over the years. And this is actually a, all of the JCN abstracts. So for how many of the abstracts of that year mention rat or mouse or human or a rhesus monkey, for example. And it's kind of neat to see that it seems like rat is increasing and it's sort of, uh, sort of losing popularity maybe in the recent years. And whereas a uh, mouse with maybe its genetic studies might be on a more increase. But yeah, this is just sort of some interesting temporal analysis you can do. But again, this is just one journal. And so you can sort of see here that the impact of the studied species. And you can see things like a pigeon, you don't really do so good. So the, the coverage rates decrease. So overall, it's 63% as I had here. Um, in the previous slides, you see things like um, pigeon. I'm not good at getting pigeon brain regions, which makes sense. Um, and also cat brain regions are not so good. But you can see things like a mouse it's really good at, at, at recognizing when an author mentions a mouse brain region or a human brain region, which is nice to see. And also the specific to general mappings decrease a lot in mouse and human, whereas in a cat, we have to do a lot of generalizations to map it to an enclosing region. And if you combine sort of these common species of human, mouse, and rat, it does a good amount better. So 69% of them are covered. Um, a lot better of the unique coverage, it goes up to 43. And uh, specific to general mappings decreases a little bit. So what we did now is now that we have the system, it's kind of automated, we uh, hooked it up to all the remaining JCN abstracts. So this covers the years from 1975 to the start of 2011. And we're able to pull out with the conditional random field, almost 150,000 uh, brain region spans. And we're able to resolve a good number, 95,000 of them. And there's a huge amount of unique terms, almost 8,000. And one of the things is you can look at sort of the, the coverage or the recall based on, on from the perspective of the lexicon. So of how many of the atlases I have, of all five of those atlases, of all those terms and synonyms and labels of brain regions, how many of them actually occur in the literature? And it's pretty low. So only 55% of the concepts are actually found in the JCN. And 77% uh, of the synonyms and terms are not matched. So only you know, a small amount, 23% are seen in the, the Journal of Comparative Neurology, which is kind of interesting. And here's just a sort of a fancy visualization if you're interested in which brain regions show up a lot. Um, the color means nothing here. Um, it's just to separate the terms. The size of the brain region is scaled to how many times it occurs. So cortex and retina appear a lot, and spinal cord, for example. And this is, yeah, from world.net, if you want to make those. Um, here's just another thing you do, a temporal analysis. So across the years, have brain regions become more or less popular? You can see things like uh, amygdala steadily increases from 2% of the abstracts you see in that year to almost 8% of the abstracts in, a, in a 2005 mentioned amygdala somewhere in the abstract. And that's kind of neat to look at. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, our work. Uh, we've been working more recently uh, getting this data out there with uh, NIF. And um, so one of the things we mentioned before is we have this 40% of specific to general matches. Um, so this is ideas where the, the parent region is in the atlas, but the sort of the newly described child region is not. So we went through and filtered our data set for these terms. And we put a bunch of filters on it to get 136 regions that we're pretty confident about. So they, for example, they occur in, more, in two or more abstracts across the journal. And we add those um, 
to Neuralex for curation. So this is sort of the, the wiki-based uh, neuroscience lexicon run by through the Neuroscience Information Framework. And so here's some example terms. Uh, these two actually occur twice in two abstracts. And so, but this one occurs, I think it occurs about four times. So you can bring these in, link it to the PubMed identifiers, and then we also link it to the enclosing term in NIF already. So it has existing connections into the, the lexicon, which is nice. And so all of these 136 accounts for about um, 2,400 combined mentions altogether. So it's a significant amount. And it would reduce our um, specific to general rate from 40% to about, I think, 37.5%. And so another thing we've been working with, uh, mostly uh, the neuroscience information people, um, Anita, Willie, and Jonathan have been doing great work on this, and is to visualize these mentions over time. So this is similar to the graph I provided. And so I've shown that graph to people before, and they'll be like, what about this brain region? You know, what about my favorite brain region? So the idea, if they can hook this up to the uh, Neuralex and see how popular is your favorite brain region over time, so you can see across the years, you know, did it, was it popular in the 90s or the 80s, for example? So this, this would be great. Let's get this going. It's pretty close, I think. And it's, yeah, it's looking good. Um, so I can, I can either skip this or go really quickly over it. Um, do you have time, Anita? Or uh, I think you should go over this because this is interesting. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll go over this really quickly. So this is so the other half of my PhD work. I'm interested in connectivity and gene expression data from the Allen Brain Atlas and the Brain Architecture Management System. So one of the things is I looked at connectivity and their relationship to the gene expression profile. So this is just, if, this is one way to compare two brain regions. So say it's here and the medial pretectal area here. So there's two brain regions. I'm interested in how can you compare these two brain regions? So you can say, for example, how far apart they are in terms of distance. The center of this brain region from the center of this, how many um, millimeters, for example. Are they connected? So is there a projection and synapses over in that other brain region? Or do they share connections? Another way you can look at it is, is their gene expression profile similar for these two brain regions? The interesting thing is, with this data set, then you can bring in information, sort of maybe more functional or informative information, where the authors have written these words in the same abstract that mention the red nucleus. So you can sort of form a co-occurrence relationship. So whenever someone mentions a red nucleus, they might mention seizures, for example. And if mentions medial pretectal area, they might mention um, or uh, sphincter maybe. So the idea is you can sort of, this gives us another way to compare two brain regions. And one of the interesting things to do, you can just say, look at it from the perspective of distance and uh, literature. So you can ask questions. So the distance, distance is an important part of this. So by knowing two brain regions are close to each other, you know they're prob more likely to be connected, and you're also to know their gene expression profiles are very strongly related. They're gonna have very similar gene expression profiles if these two brain regions are beside each other. So that's the spatial autocorrelation. And it's, so, it's, so these, those numbers would be high positive numbers, a very strong signal in the brain that things are beside each other, then they're more like each other. What's interesting is these literature profiles seem to go against that and that, so neighboring brain regions seem to be not similarly described. So it's a negative spatial autocorrelation. So if two brain regions are beside each other, what's written about those brain regions, at least in JCN, seems to be very different. So the correlation is a negative um, 0.1, so it's kind of small. And again, this is kind of preliminary work that I sort of threw together for this data mining. And we're using 119 Allen brain atlas regions. And again, maybe the authors are writing about distinctive characteristics that separate this brain region from its neighbors. And so just quickly over the conclusion. So we found that the mentions can be made high precision. And we found there's extensive uh, lexical variation. And the lexicons have many unused, unused terms. And also they lack some of the terms that are frequently used. And we took steps to sort of address this. And also the formalized lexicons um, are needed for less common species. So it'd be good to have a, a well-formalized pigeon lexicon, for example. And future work will focus on linking brain regions to each other and also to other concepts, to drugs and diseases. And so I'd like to acknowledge, of course, my supervisor, 
um, Suzanne Lane and Lydia Zoot, who worked on uh, annotating these abstracts, which is painstaking and a lot of work, which is which provided this great data set, which is so large, and if you like, and also the other members of the Vetus Lab. Um, also, the neuroscience information work for helping me uh, get the data out there. Uh, Anita, Jonathan, Stephen, and Marianne, and uh, Willie. And also, all the, um, the atlases, as I've acknowledged previously, um, for making it accessible and downloadable online. So I can download names, down reference atlas, the, the Swanson atlas, and the BRAID database terms. And yeah, there's just more information. So in this paper, someone asked about the part of speech tagging. It, it's described in uh, this paper. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay. So I have a couple of questions, uh, but maybe uh, I should let other people ask questions first. Uh, I, I think we... Why, why don't you guys go ahead? Um. I think it was just, it was easiest to hook up the code. Like I think I already had the code in an existing library, so I just, I, ha I think it was just accessibility of the software, but yeah. I could try the, the Porter software as well. I'm, I'm guessing that, uh, I'm just, I'm guessing the Porter and the Lovins would be similar, but yeah, I, I could try that for sure. It's pretty fast um, for the prediction. Um, let me see. I, most I've, I've spent more time just uh, dealing with uh, special characters that break the pipeline, for example. So um, I think I can run, like, in order to run all of JCN, once I got it outside of that training corpus, so those 12,000 un. it was less than a week. But most of that week was my time just uh, setting up the code, dealing with memory constraints. I have a couple too, actually. So I would say that 12,000 could probably go through the pipeline in 2014. Um, you, uh, you commented on using the, the Lovin stemmer. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. And I'm curious uh, if, if there was a reason you chose that over Porter stemming. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> one of the questions is if you of text processing and matching along the way, right? So we were okay. to take the same approach for any other... Uh, and I was also curious how... Task, not just brain regions. Go ahead. Uh, how automated is the software framework to allow that for you know, some other... Uh, I was also curious how, how efficient this is. How long does it take to, to run an abstract through, very, very through the well. system? So, there's a huge amount of past work. Um, a lot of the work is going through uh, named entities. So it's named entity uh, recognition, and it's a, a pretty big domain in natural language processing, which I didn't really acknowledge. But a lot of the work, so there's, they're like over 90% accurate at extracting people's names, uh, city names. And so this is an active field of academic research, and there's lots of tools. And, and I definitely made use of these tools. For example, the gate um, software from um, Britain, I made use of that for this annotation uh, framework. So the software where you use the mouse and highlight all these brain regions, that was all done for me. I just okay. up to that. Uh, the conditional random field framework. Okay. Thanks. From Thanks a lot. From McCallum, that was already coded, and it was pretty easy to use. Um, the only stuff I pretty much had to write, I wrote the stem matching software, the exact string matching. but Again, that's pretty easy to, to write, all those these mapping methods. So yeah, it's there's tons of software that can be reused and tons of papers that tell you what will probably work and what will not work. So you just have to, the key thing is to make your training corpus and, and label the entities you're interested in. Actually, you, you touched upon my second question, which is uh, in this presentation, you didn't actually uh, well, give us sort of a software diagram, which would have, I would have liked to see just from a technical perspective. You mentioned some of them, but I'm sure you have a slide somewhere which says, okay, here is 
the software pipeline that's getting used in the whole process? Um, yeah, I, I should. I, I don't have a slide currently. I should put that together. Um, it's it's quite a few steps actually. So I should put it. So there's stuff like downloading I, the abstract and yeah, doing the abbreviations. But yeah, I'll, I'll make a slide for that for the future. Okay. Okay, so um, I have a question, uh, unless somebody else wants to ask. Okay, um, so quick question, hopefully. Um, when you have these things um, exported, can you, um, uh, what are the, the ways right now other than, um, you know, matching up, here's a PubMed abstract and here's an entity uh, URI, um, do you have like the position in text encoded in any way that is also usable? Uh, yeah, yeah, we have like so the character 103 to character 126. That's that's in our. I'm pretty sure it's in the. It might not be, but it, I may have missed it. Um, I I have it broken down by sentences. I'll have to look at the RDF data model and the. I'm not sure if the data we're releasing. I have the span so the actual string. Mm -hmm. is, so you could go through the abstract and find an exact match for that string. Okay. So yeah, it's all of that. Yeah, all, pretty much all of the data is available and accessible for the first step. The the normalization data is coming online. So for that complete, uh, for those almost 1,400 abstracts, you can download those abstracts as either XML or the gate format and see all of those bands, and then the gate. Uh, software provides an API to access that, so you can make a, make a for loop, go through all the abstracts, and then go through all the spans and pull that out easily too. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, are there other questions? Okay, in that case, um, Leon, again, thank you very much. We appreciate your uh, your uh, time and your efforts. Okay. And. Um,